the subject today is the third installment in a series that deal with the subject of transformation of business in defense. The reason I'm concentrating on defense because in Washington, including the contractors, this is predominantly a defense business which totally dominates the economic picture of this environment. And therefore, talking about defense is significant. I will start the discussion with a case study because it is an example of the kind of thinking that is coming from private industry that is now starting to permeate the Department of Defense and also the other federal agencies. The dominant factor to be considered in all business transformation is exemplified on this chart which shows you how Hewlett Packard started in a period of four years to dramatically reduce applications. What I want to convey to you is that the history of computing over the last 50 years has been driven by the compulsion to create applications. And so applications were written, applications which were not exactly the way they looked about every particular organization wanted a slightly different approach to the same problem. This is how you end up with an estimated 149 personnel systems in the Department of Defense. And of course, that is supported by hundreds of special desktop kind of application doing personnel. What this chart shows is that Hewlett Packard is combining the applications and ending up with less than 10% of applications by changing the structure of the applications and making them serve a broader range of constituencies. Let me perhaps give you a better explanation of what this is all about. This shows the before transformation and after transformation pictures. Just to give you some example, you ought to understand that Hewlett Packard, not IBM, is the largest computer corporation. I just want everybody to understand this is so. They are now at current at 96 billion, going to 112 billion. The budget, and this is really the number that you ought to concentrate on, is actually being reduced from 3 billion to 2.1 billion as the company grows by more than 30%. The workforce, which is even more important, and it's very significant, is shrinking. That is, the IT workforce is shrinking from 19,000 to 8,000. And the reason is that if you don't have applications, you don't need the IT workforce. So the IT workforce is migrating to do other things. They are not firing people. They are just moving them out of IT into doing business process development. The number of applications are going down by 68%. The number of servers are going down by 47%, but the 10,000 servers in 2008 are at least 50 times more powerful per server than the servers in 2003. There has been approximately a 24% cumulative improvement in the capacity of servers in the last four years. Now, the other reason why they've been able to shrink the workforce is they have gone from 100 development sites to 29. In other words, they had development sites set up wherever there were factories, wherever there was manufacturing, wherever some work was being done. 
Well, they saw no point in doing that since information technology and communications make it possible for a desktop or a screen to communicate and it almost doesn't matter where it is. Therefore, they have gone from 86 data centers to six data centers. In fact, if you really want to know, these are three data centers. But there are two data centers side by side. In other words, one data center is working, the other one is backing up. So physically, there are three data centers. They are all in the United States, and they are serving global environment. They have taken percentage of people to innovation. In other words, once you have less applications and less facilities, you have more people available for innovation. And much of the money comes out of software maintenance. See, if you don't have that many applications, you have less maintenance. The big money, however, and you know, there is a model that I've built that replicates uh, Hewlett Packard, really comes from the fact that less money is being spent on the infrastructure. You don't build an infrastructure for every site. You just build a few infrastructures. You are going down to a small number of infrastructures, and maybe in the future you will go to more. So this gives you a picture of what transformation is all about. This, is, this program is three and a half years. This is a six-year program. They are three and a half years down on the pike on the program and headed in the right direction. I will single out one particular variable out of this situation, which has to do with a data warehouse. One of the reasons you have so many applications of why you have so many maintenance people is because everybody builds their own database. It is the preferred possession of a bureaucracy is to have their own database. And you preferably want to have a database that has different terms than somebody else's database. So for instance, it is quite conceivable that a birth date, uh, you would be surprised how many versions and forms of birth dates can be defined and all put into different databases which are then made incompatible. Very important situation, and perhaps this is the pivotal and the major development of Hewlett Packard, is to go to an enterprise data warehouse which is a consolidated warehouse out of which all of the data is being fed and all of the redundancies are being eliminated. Here are some indications they are tracking very well and uh, the particular benefits that I want to point out to you are not only the benefits derived from cutting the IT budget by a billion, but also by saving money elsewhere. That is a scorecard which then physically keeps track of the success of this program. Now, why is this thing possible? And the answer is that the ability to consolidate and standardize and integrate is really dependent on the fact that most of the applications are very similar. So why keep them separate if you can consolidate them and streamline them and standardize them so that uh, the similarities are absorbed into a consolidated environment. The lack of commonality then is handled by what I call portals. Today I will not spend time on portals, 
Portals basically give an opportunity to achieve variety so that you can, at your screen, use the so-called portal to manipulate the data and get your particular need and your particular requirement displayed without having to dig into the depth of the data warehouse. Here is an example uh, of a way how you can actually go and calculate. This is a very simple calculator. It's basically a simplified Excel spreadsheet that has many details, but it's something, Bob, that you may want to consider uh, having people use as a classroom exercise. You know, how would you transform, how would you shrink uh, AOL or, or whatever your favorite charity is? <laughs> and um, uh, by really looking at the key variables, uh, which is number of application, number of servers, number of development sites, number of data centers, percentage of money spent on maintenance, and percentage of money spent in infrastructure. It turns out that there is just a few indicators which, uh, by the way, you're making notes, uh, this is all going to be available on the web, and you'll be able to copy it. That, that helps me remember. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, everything, all of these lectures are available on the web. And uh, over 10,000 copies have been made of Mr. T Santucci's work. Uh, so he gets all the credit. By the way, and it's, it's all available courtesy of Google. And uh, something like 5,000 people have actually downloaded the presentations and made copies of them. So, so I just want you to know you can benefit from all of that. At any rate, so here is a very simple calculator where you basically take your numbers and you can then go and do the calculations based on numbers which are, of course, hidden behind the spreadsheet, but they will tell you that how you can then move your variables. And that basically means that if you have an organization that is very rich on data center, very rich on servers, very rich on many sites, how you can then start transforming. And then as a result of it, you can calculate the percentages of reduction that you can achieve from the changes in the parameters. Uh, by the way, at the bottom, you have a series of indicators which I used where you can actually calculate a composite for transformation. In this particular case, which is Hewlett Packard, it was a 64% composite transformational reduction which I, of course, consider, if you're over 50%, that's exceptional. And that is the target. As a matter of fact, if I can say anything about Washington, this 50% reduction target is going to happen. Now, when? Uh, it will be in your lifetime. You are just young enough to be able to see it, for sure. But you are going to see a very radical change. Not Jerry, it's not necessarily you, Jerry, though. But uh, you will see that um, the transformation is now the topic in this town because the old systems are just not affordable. All right, so I warmed you up by giving you a case study from Hewlett-Packard. By the way, there are other case studies like this. The most uh, 
pronounced and perhaps most impressive case study is Federal Express. They have done better than 50%. They have totally transformed their internal structure, consolidated all of their businesses. As you know from your own observation, Federal Express is a premier, outstanding, and high-performance company. So let me now go into the Department of Defense. Let me just rehash what I'm talking about. The DOD transformation consists of a net-centric operations, data strategy, enterprise services, and information assurance. There are four major elements of transformation. I have talked about net-centric operations, data strategy, today's enterprise services that I'm discussing. And my next lecture will be about information assurance which is really the subject dealing with security, which is the big problem. I will restrict myself in my comments on the business mission area. There are warfighter areas, there are intelligence area, but they are so huge and so complicated and so classified that I suppose that's not the subject to bring up. So I will just talk about the business mission area. So let's now look where the money is, because money is what makes this thing move. And uh, the bulk of the money is in agencies, which is DISA, DLA, and DFAS. And then you have Air Force, Army, and Navy. And I would like to comment that the hardest working and the poorest are the Army, and they need it more than anybody else, but that's the way it is. Let me just give you another cut of what the budget looks like. There are 45% of the money is in applications. And the projects which I'm using, these are large projects. The projects in DOD then consist of hundreds of little pieces. But these are the projects which are grouped at the budget level. The communication infrastructure is 44%. And then you have what's called information assurance. Now, that's a new item that only appeared in the last two and a half years. My view is that the com communications and computing infrastructure is inseparable from the information assurance. At any rate, any way you look at it, the bulk of the spending is now in the infrastructure. Now, taking apart the management systems, you could see here uh, that there are 792 personnel system. And by the way, this is 792 personnel systems. And again, you must understand, these are super systems and they are divided into components. So when you go into the piece parts, you may actually find 7,000 pieces. And each piece is handled by a contract which has been awarded in a different ways. The largest collection of systems are, is in logistics. It's by far dominating. So I just want you to know that is the structure of DOD amounting to uh, what uh, I estimate to be about $9 billion. Now, this is $9 billion of IT spending. That is not the cost of business management because it does not include the people who actually operate the IT. So I would like you to understand that every time you see a dollar spent on IT, you assume fairly accurately 
that there is another four to five dollars of people, mostly contractors, by the way, behind it. So uh, we are talking about big money. Uh, again, uh, the applications are 3.8 billion and the infrastructure is 5 billion. And this is only the piece that support the business mission. Remember, there's business mission, warfighter mission, and intelligence mission. So this is the piece of that. Everybody gets that. Yes, 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 okay. So, just to make sure that you understand that IT is not information systems, and so that you understand that IT is not information management, I have extracted from a report that was published two months ago, which basically says that when you add the management costs to the IT cost, that is 53% of a business that is called the Department of Defense, which is today estimated at 480 billion. So when you study here IT, please remember that what you're studying is only the tip of what you are seeing. And that the dominant thing that is shaping this animal, this whole environment, is really people, administrators, people filling out forms, people doing procurement, people going to meetings, lots of meetings, you know, there's lots of e meetings in this. And it is about 53% of the enterprise. Uh, and the reason is that in the warfighting side, the, uh, the, the guys who do the warfighting don't have to, too many times to go to meetings. So this is why the clerks and the contractors and all the paper pushers dominate the picture. So would you please remember that IT is not systems and systems is not information management. If you learn nothing from this course here, that's one thing I want you to learn. Now, how does this work? It's, it's very important to understand how it works. Well, the current organization of how this thing is put together is set up that the Air Force, Army, and Navy each build their own infrastructure, and they don't have one infrastructure, they don't have two infrastructures, they don't have 100 infrastructures, they have hundreds, because each infrastructure has been built for the application. Then on top of this infrastructure, you have applications. You know, you have so many finance, so many HR, so many logistics, and so forth. Now, I'm giving you a highly simplified picture of how the thing works. It is a proliferation of infrastructures on which sits a proliferation of applications. Now, obviously, that is not the way to run any organization. Now, there are good reasons for that. The good reasons for that is that if you tried ever to combine things like this, uh, the bigger the projects got, uh, the greater the failure rates. So the organization of the Department of Defense, and this is cultural, behavioral, sociological, or what have you, has learned that by keeping things small, you avoid huge uh, mess-ups. So that's how you ended up. Also, from a funding standpoint, it always pays 
every time you turn around to do another one, to do another one, rather than try to systematize. Well, you can do this thing for 20 years, you can do it for 30 years, you can do it for 40 years, and sooner or later you run out of money. So here is the current proposed way how the transformation of the Department of Defense will take place. The objective is to set up a shared infrastructure. In other words, to set up a telecommunication environment that serves everybody. Then combine applications for everybody and let the, the Air Force, Army, and Navy get their differences extracted by means of portals. Now, I've given you a highly simplified version of what the transformation looks like, but this is exactly what Hewlett Packard and what uh, Federal Express and what Visa and, and so forth and so forth do. So, that is the direction. And the reason this is important is because you are going to be living this environment, whether you know it or not. You are young enough. Uh, you are uh, on the average age here would be in the low 20s with a life expectancy and the increased medical costs. Uh, you are not going to earn enough to retire at the age of 45 or 50. So you most likely will have to work uh, to keep yourself alive until at least 85 or so. So that's my forecast for you. So now figure this thing out. You are now, let's say, 25. You're going to be working until the age of 85, so you've got another 60 years to go. Now would you please do that arithmetic once more because this is important for you. So now you have another 60 years to go. And you say, what the hell am I going to be doing for 60 years? And I'm telling you, whether you like it or not, this is what you're going to be doing. In various forms, under various disguises, under different environments. But that's what you're going to be doing. You are going to be take, putting together what took 50 years to take apart. Now, that has vast implication on your education and on your careers. Just to make sure that you don't think that Strassman just figured this thing out, I'm giving you a copy of the latest PowerPoint slide from the highest levels of the Department of Defense, which basically said exactly what I just told you. You have Enterprise environment, governance, communications, computing, enterprise services, information, assure, which are shared by everybody. And that means that you then have business missions, war fighting missions, and then that goes into governance, which is Army, Navy, and Air Force. So the signals are out there that this is the direction in which we are going. The question, of course, is how you go execute, but that is a question that uh, we are going to be debating, and certainly I'm spending quite a bit of my time uh, at my age. I'm, I'm really ready for retirement. As a matter of fact, this is my fifth retirement job, but, but I, I guess I'm still being dragged into this thing. And, and my view is that um, when I look at the cost reductions which are available, uh, as the complexity of the defense business increases, I see the potential of taking at least, um, well, um, 3.5, 4.5 billion dollars out as a cost is a saving so that the money can be then reinvented 
and re repositioned and repurposed into innovation. So, how do you do this? Well, I'm losing sleep over that. So should you. When you have nothing else to worry about. So I don't want to add to your worries. Nevertheless, the very important thing that you have to worry about when you do your teamwork, and you have teams that go out to look at situations, is the number one thing that you look at is data, 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 data. If you don't have data that is interoperable, you've got nothing. So the first thing you have to do if you want to slim anything down or streamline anything down, you have to go and get data synchronized, standardized, and eliminate the redundancies. You cannot tolerate uh, 25 definitions of the date or the name of a locality. It has to be one. And that means that you cannot then have applications that translate to another application to translate another application to understand who said what. The data has to be available. Once you standardize your data, you can go after the applications. Once you go after the application, you can go after operating cost reductions. And once you have done that, and the money comes out, you can then do rapid delivery of new capabilities because you have free cash available. So the problem is that, if, you know, the current budget, which is 30.6 billion, in a limited sense, actually it's more, but that's the number I'm going to focus. That's bigger by a factor of 10 than the largest corporate budget. Now, would you please understand this thing? You know, everybody talks about corporate America and the government. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me just tell you, the government is more times, 10 times, or more bigger than the largest of the corporate America. And then, by the way, the largest corporate America, which is about 3.2 billion for Chase Manhattan, quickly tails down, and the corporate budgets are usually, even for large corporations, running at 100 to 100, 200 million dollars. So, what you have to really understand is the enormous juxtaposition between the government, which is humongous, and corporate America. And the government cannot afford it anymore, just cannot afford it. Not because it cannot afford spending $30 billion, but because it's not getting what it needs for that kind of money. So, what you need, and this, this can go into long discussion, but what you need is some kind of an engine that will take your legacy systems, chew them up, and spit them out. You need a legacy application that will take business process models and metadata, and then do the translation so that the client at the other end can deal with it. Now, this is a very complicated chart that has far-reaching implication. I don't want to go into the discussion of this chart. All I'm telling you is that uh, the transformation will not happen unless you set up an engine, a ma machinery for taking the legacy application and the transform application and spitting them out in a way that are new and having a different architecture. In fact, that is already in the process, and this is a slide again from a policy level document. I don't want to go into the details of it, but it really looks at the data at the bottom feeding 
these services. And COI at the top is community of interest. So we are not talking about Air Force, Navy, and Army anymore. We are talking about communities of interest. So what are then the transformation function? Lots of pieces have to be in place. You need business process models. In other words, as you are taking this mess of stuff and flinging, swimming it out, you cannot drop anything. So you need a model that will take you on the way. And by the way, these kind of transitions are talking, we are talking about transitions that will take 5 to 15 years. And during that process, you cannot drop anything. So you need models. You need shared services. You need transformed services so that you can take your shared services and move them into a new thing. The best analogy that I have to offer, in the United States in the 19th century, in 1860, we built a network of railroads, trolley cars, canals, and they were not compatible and the gauges were different, and the bridges were carrying different weight, and what have you. So the question then was, you know, how do you take this transportation system and move it to a new one? And the way it was done was basically, they just went and built a new railroad system, and then moved everything from the old system, because the old system has still had to carry this freight. You, you could not shut it down. So the transform services mean that you have a service directory, you have a map of knowing what is where, and then you need a service portal so that people can get at it. Now, the question then is, what is the thing that is really going to be in a way that's going to stop the transformation? My view is that the real problem is software. And after you decide how you fix software, then you will change the organization. See, there are lots of people who are trying to achieve transformation by changing organization and leaving everything else in place. And that doesn't work. It's just rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. Have you ever heard of that? So, what? Well, so what I'm going to talk about now, and you're giving me a lead, is I'm going to talk about software. Because you really have to start thinking how you're going to make software. And then, after you have figured that out, you're going to decide how you're going to organize. Because software is the thing that drives it. So let me take you through all the pains of the current problems of organization. First, it takes too long to get anything done. So the requirements are seldom 50% complete. In other words, when you start on the project, your requirements are not complete. And then when you take another two years to th talk about requirements, they will get less complete. So when you finally get an OK to proceed with implementation, you are starting with things which are totally incomplete. Very important thing to consider from an organizational standpoint. How do you shortcut the development cycle so you don't get stuck with incomplete? Point number one. Second thing is that bugs. Software is unbelievably buggy. The longer you take to do software, the buggier it becomes. The more you fix software, the buggier it becomes. So basically what happens is you, if you do this long enough, you just chuck the whole thing and start all over again. Again, this, there's an organizational concept in here. Another thing which is invented by bureaucracy is, well, since your software is not 
well done, not well defined. The way you're going to deal with that, you just create documentation. In other words, don't program, just document. And as the thing extends longer and longer, you have more and more documentation. And by the way, you have to understand, we are talking about documentation that is piles and piles high. When you finally get done with an application, you go into testing. The problem is that the testing has been so patched and so adjust that you cannot test it. You must understand uh, if you are dealing, I don't know whether you know the expression function points. Function point is not lines of code, but it's how many I.O. input-output functions they are. Once you get over 5,000 function points, it's not testable. There are billions and billions and billions of permutations and combinations. When you then decide to compensate for your inability to test by creating test cases, the test case have bugs. So now you have a test case that has bugs, testing an application that has bugs. God help you. So, you know, I can go on and on and on. 5% of software codes end up in litigation. 35% of projects get canceled. 50% of project will be one year late. So, whichever you pick of these will tell you that you are dealing with a managerial dysfunctionality. So if you are trying to reorganize without taking into consideration these hard facts, what do you do? Okay. Well, there are some answers. First thing you have to understand, there's over 600 programming languages, and these are variants. There are over 40 different ways of doing coding. There are 38 known different metrics for measuring software. There are 26 development methods which are established, and there are at least 100 sort of floating around. And there are 25 international standards organizations often contradicting one another. So now you are this poor program manager. Uh, you love to be a program manager, right? You, you got yourself a problem because you got all of this stuff and everybody's pulling in different direction. So what you have to then do, you have to start deciding that you are not going to have that many options. You cannot have a capability maturity model. You cannot have a CMMI. You cannot have crystal and so forth and so forth. In other words, you have ISO standards which contradict CMM. Then you have a RAD which rejects ISO 9000 which rejects CMM. I don't know what you are being taught here in this uh, school here, but I'm sure you're being taught, uh, Don, I hope you're t teaching some of these things. I see, you avoid the problem. Well, good. But nevertheless, nevertheless, when you are a manager of application, you've got this, these problems because this is execution. I don't want to go into the detail of how you measure things, but there's this thing called cosmic function points. Frankly, I've never figured out what it means, but it's a, there is a book about the subject. And there is a number of consultants who actually are using that, that technique. Now, the last thing that I want to bore you with is how you do testing of large systems. Now, this is very important because 
uh, more than twice as much time is spent in testing than in actually writing code. And when, you, when the project gets bigger, over 15 to 20,000 function points, you're talking five times more effort spent on testing than on writing. You have requirements inspection, design inspections, document inspection, code inspections, software quality assurance reviews, unit testing, component testing, regression testing, performance testing, systems testing, and acceptance testing. And by the way, consultants get very, very well paid for that. I mean, they really make money on this. I mean, this is, this is as lucrative as you can get. You can keep testing and testing and testing and have billable rates, you know, it's just great. Now, that is for the techies. So you have a whole bunch of techies doing all of this stuff. And then you have poor uh, business majors, psychology majors, people looking for employment. What do they do? Well, they do the paperwork. They do the monthly status reporting, weekly progress reports, daily communications, email support, video conferencing, a distribution of documents. I mean, there is an infinite amount of work to be done, billable work, to surround all of this thing. Now, you wanted me to reorganize so that I can solve the problem of transformation. And I'm telling you, you got yourself a problem. The problem is not how the organization chart is put together. The problem deals with the root of the issue, which is the structure of how things are done. Luckily, it gives you lots of jobs. There is an infinite number of jobs. There are thousands and thousands of jobs. Some of you may be lucky enough to get jobs like this. By the way, these are fairly well-paid jobs. And I don't want to list all of them, but they have wonderful titles. Configuration control, cost estimation, data quality, domain knowledge specialist, human factor specialist, integration specialist, etc. So what you have to understand that this whole area of information technology is wrapped around with thousands and thousands of people. So what ultimately happens, this is not doable, but nevertheless, you have a problem and you have to solve it. So what do you do? You just carve for yourself a small piece Pick one of those development methods, pick one of those testing methods, pick one of those coding methods, surround yourself with plenty of documentation people and people who write uh, all of the documentation. You pick something and then you go and deliver the best way you can and hope you don't get canceled. So what you have then is the whole arena of systems development in the federal sector. And by the way, the commercial sector, but it's not tolerated anymore, looks like a political battle. So what I'm saying is that the software is the problem. Uh, you keep trying new software development approaches and the quality tends to improve. But when you revisit these new methods, uh, they are abandoned because they are not sustainable because the people come and go and the contractors come and go. And therefore, the new management who comes in just starts with a new, pro uh, with a new idea and a new project. What I want to show you here is a matrix, and this is hard facts, by the way, this is from Capers Jones the foremost expert on the subject of project. It just basically says if you do a big project, the chances of it being canceled are 48% or better. And therefore, what you're going to do, you are just going to do small projects and more and more 
until you run out of money. That's the dynamics. Uh, here is a description of function point. I don't want to belabor it. You will see it. It just describes what a function point is. It's a very important concept. What I want to show you what to do about it. Uh, I prepared a calculator, how you slim down software. And, and again, the thing is, how many enterprise applications, how many major applications, how many minor applications, how many databases do you have, and how many networks? So if you have those variable, you know, these are the fundamental dimensions of an organization, then it means that you can then just go and consolidate and um, then out of that, uh, take people out of maintenance and put them into development because you have slimmed down and eliminated the complexity of the software. You are going to cut the function points. You're going to cut down the software cost. You're going to increase people in development and decrease people in software maintenance. So in summary then, there are thousands of ways how systems, projects can fail. And there are only a very few ways how they can succeed. And they can only succeed through transformation. There is no other way. Therefore, transformation calls for consolidation of applications and data center operations. Transformation reduces the risks by separating applications from infrastructure. You cannot combine infrastructure with applications. And therefore, you really have to reorganize. And now I'm going to answer your question. How do you reorganize? The answer is you reorganize software. Now you have to find a management structure that will do it. But you don't start with reorganization. You start with going after software. Thank you very much.